Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today we'll look at the challenges faced by thousands of foreign students in the UK who are in legal limbo after losing their visa. Then we'll examine what's in the minds of voters as South Africa's election draws near. Send your thoughts through Twitter and also YouTube. But first, there is widespread anger among people in Hong Kong over proposals to allow the territory to extradite people to countries that include mainland China. On Sunday, thousands of people took to the streets. Organisers say that 130,000 people joined the march. People say the crowd size was about a sixth of that. That's the police questioning those figures. But the rally came four days after key figures within the pro-democracy umbrella movement were imprisoned for their role in a 79-day occupation of Hong Kong. And that was back in 2014. So what lies ahead for the pro-democracy movement? We're joined from Hong Kong by activist Joshua Wong. He was a key leader of the 2014 occupation. Also in Hong Kong, Elaine Wu. She's a correspondent at the news agency AFP. So it's good to have you both here. Oh, goodness, look at these pictures, Elaine. I haven't seen these pictures for a very long time. People here protesting the extradition bill. I found this on your Twitter feed. So looking at this, what are we seeing here, Elaine? So we see protesters dressed up as mainland police. And there are a lot of widespread fear in Hong Kong about whether law enforcement in China can in the future work in Hong Kong openly. So they're really just yeah, dressing up to mm. show that. Another picture here, Joshua, what do you see when you see this picture, recent picture of people out in the streets again? What are you thinking here? After the end of umbrella movement in 2014 to fight for free election and democracy, mm. 100,000 people come to the street again to ask for free election and especially to against the hardline suppression from Beijing, especially China, just try to impose the extradition law in Hong Kong to freely extradite anyone live in Hong Kong to mainland China for trial. We sort of explained a little bit at the very top of, of this segment about what we're talking about in terms of this extradition bill, what it might mean if you travel outside of Hong Kong and go to mainland China. We also spoke to some other young people about how they could explain what their fears and concerns might be. Have a listen. Once this law has been passed, it won't matter if you're an average person or a foreigner coming through Hong Kong. There will be a real possibility you'll be taken and sent off to the mainland. The extradition law will affect everyone, especially young people, as they frequently join activities on the mainland or go shopping there. And once this extradition law has been passed, these activities will carry the risk of being misused to extradite people. Elaine, why has this happened now? So it has a long story. It, there is a murder case in Taiwan where they are Hong Kongers involved, but after the murder, um, it, it was between a couple. Um, the man had fled back to Hong Kong. And because there is no extradition agreement between Taiwan and Hong Kong, uh, the man cannot be tried for murder in Taiwan and could only be tried for another fraud case in Hong Kong. So people are saying the government is taking advantage of the murder to push for a deal that did not have to include mainland China, but mm. now has. So people are, a lot of critics and opponents of the bill are questioning the motive behind that and why it's even necessary to include China in the deal. Joshua, there's Samuel here on Twitter. He says Beijing will crack down without any regard to international reaction. There are protests right now. What is the idea of the protests? What are they trying to actually uh, do in terms of this extradition bill? Still a bill, not a law. Uh, we urge the government to withdraw the extradition law amendment that strongly erodes on Hong Kong's autonomy. Especially we are aware that it strongly uh, erodes and also foully on the principle of one country, two system. That's the promise of Beijing. Mm. President Xi was Hong Kong, but now already turned with one country, one and a half system. And especially, we are fully aware and afraid of when anyone live or based in Hong Kong and, or any tourists in Hong Kong might be extradited to mainland China. That's the place without fair and open trial. 
Joshua, we of course we remember you from the 2014 Occupy movement, the Umbrella movement in Hong Kong. I'm looking here at a headline and a story that Elaine, you wrote quite recently, and it says Hong Kong democracy leaders jailed over the Umbrella movement protest. That is going back some years, but this has just happened. Is that a coincidence that these pro-democracy movement uh, activists should be jailed just at the same time as an extradition bill was being unveiled? I think it's all leading to a moment where people are feeling there's so much going on at the same time. I think it's at any moment in Hong Kong in the last two years or so, it feels like there has been multiple crackdowns uh, on freedoms and on dissent happening. So it definitely, with the culmination of all these events, it has uh, contributed to what we saw last Sunday, which is you know the biggest protest since the famous umbrella movement by any counts. So it has helped galvanize people in that way. Joshua, the last time the world was really paying attention to Hong Kong in terms of protesting was around 2014. What have you been doing in that interim period? Has the umbrella movement died down? Are you changing your tactics? What's going on? The uh, political system in Hong Kong remains unchanged, especially uh, under the hardline policy of Emperor Xi, which means Xi Jinping. But I would like to emphasize that uh, in the previous day, dissident or activists might not be jailed. It might be the situation only happened in mainland China. But mm. in the recent years, it seems that being locked in prison or political prosecution become kind of common norm in Hong Kong, but we have never given up. That's why 100,000 people come to the street again and to against hardline suppression from Beijing. Elaine, I'm just wondering how many people might be caught up in the uh, extradition bill? Does it affect a lot of people? Um, the scale is not immediately certain. It can span from business people. The business community has been especially concerned about this. But people are saying, by principle, is the fact that Hong Kong's independent judiciary is not protected um, and can be exposed to the lack of free trial. Uh, a uh, fair trial in China, then it can happen to anyone because the law is not very clear in China what's legal and what's illegal. And the uncertainty of that is really spooking a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Joshua, what's the, yeah. what's the plan? What's the next move? Uh, one point I would like to add is the U.S., British and Taiwan government, along mm. with the European Union, already expressed their opposition to the extraditional amendment. And I believe more and more people will come to the street again. And I urge the international communities to keep the eyes in Hong Kong because large scale massive mobilization will happen again in the next few months in Hong Kong. I want to say thank you very much to our activist Joshua Wong and also journalist Elaine Yu. We will continue to follow the story coming out of Hong Kong. And now, foreign students in the UK who have had their visas cancelled are awaiting a final ruling on whether they can stay legally in the country. In 2014, the Home Office acted against thousands of people amid allegations of cheating in language tests that foreign individuals must pass for a visa. Those affected say that they have been unfairly treated by the government. The worst nightmare anybody could have in their life. And I don't want any human being to go through the pain and the agony which I had in my life. I don't have anything left. I don't have any money. And I don't know what will, my, what will be my next, next day. For more on this, we are joined from Glasgow, Scotland by Nazek Ramadan. She is director of Migrant Voice, which is campaigning on behalf of those who have lost their visa. Nazek, it is impossible to look at those young people and not be touched by their emotion, how upset they are. It's not usual for Migrant Voice to take on cases with students or young people. Why did you take this one on? What was the motivation behind that? Uh, yes, you're right, because uh, international students uh, in many countries are not seen as migrants because they're seen as people who come spend few years in the country and return back to their uh, country of origin. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've taken this issue because of the uh, level of injustice those students faced and because those students were also caught in, in a hostile environment uh, 
uh, for migrants in UK that dominated our politics in the past uh, <clears throat> few years. Uh, we just could not ignore the scale uh, of this injustice and the number of people who are affected. Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about uh, tens of thousands uh, of international students that's, who uh, that's, come mainly... That's so many, tens of thousands of students. Absolutely. I think up to uh, 56,000 students were caught into this scandal. Uh, 50, maybe 36,000 uh, of them nearly were uh, had their visa revoked. Uh, and they were told, uh, kicked out of universities, and uh, they were told to leave the country, go back to the country, with a criminal allegation hanging over them. Mm -hmm. uh, 22,000 were told, your test has been questionable, uh, you might have cheated. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a huge number of, of uh, young men and women who lost their future, uh, were wrongly accused of cheating, uh, without them being presented with the evidence against them. And uh, most of them had no opportunity uh, to uh, prove their innocence, to challenge, to challenge this allegation. Wow. Uh, yet this allegation, this is a criminal allegation, is hanging over them. Uh, will follow them for the rest of their lives if they don't clear their names. Uh, it means that uh, they cannot go and continue their studies at other universities. No one will have them. Uh, they cannot get a job because they have criminal allegation. They cannot uh, get a visa to travel anywhere else in the world. Goodness me. Goodness uh, and, me. Uh, and remember, those students, uh, they came in good faith. They came to the UK for its good reputation, uh, uh, universities, so and I'm education. Trying to, I'm just trying to... I, you're, I'm, you're, you're telling us about the impact of what this actually means, the fact that they will lose their visas. I'm trying to understand what happened. They sat a test. Did everybody sit a test at exactly the same time? Or was it multiple tests? And then they were accused of cheating. Well, it's, uh, it all started when there's a BBC Panorama program in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, showed, they exposed that there was some cheating in the English language test, the one you mentioned, that the students, they need to renew their visa. Right. Uh, at two right. centres only. But remember, in the UK, there are, I think, up to 96 different centres. Uh, so the way the Home Office and the government responded to this program was, in, in you know, instead of going to other centres and investigating, uh, they asked the uh, uh, English language uh, agency, yeah. uh, the testing yeah. agency, which is an American agency called ETS, uh, well, the agency which was accused of facilitating the cheating, they asked them to investigate. And, and the, the government relied on the evidence presented by this uh, testing company. Uh, and we discovered later, because there were hundreds of cases, that, yeah. uh, of court yeah. cases, uh, students were so desperate to clear their names because for them their future end there. Uh, and then we discovered later on how flawed, how unreliable... This is, Nazek, Nazek, this is such a hot mess. Uh, uh, to try and sort of unpack this for us a little bit more, and I know he's been doing some reporting on this, is uh, Robert Wright. He's social policy correspondent at the Financial Times. We spoke to him a little bit earlier. Have a listen. I have looked in considerable detail at the way the UK Home Office handled these cheating claims. The impression that emerges is of a department that initially panicked over the cheating allegations and that then let ETS, the company that had done a great deal to create the problem, mark its own homework. They should have realised there was a terrible mistake being made when ETS came back and said there was a question mark over more than 96% of the tests. Instead, the department pressed ahead ignored all evidence to the contrary and tried to revoke the visas of 36,000 people on the basis of evidence so thin it's hard to see how anyone could possibly have relied on it. Nazette, let me share with you some of the comments from our online community. Suleiman says here, foreign students contribute positively to the UK economy. So he's seeing the value. You can mention how many students this might actually possibly impact. And will they be just told wholesale, leave the country? Is that what's going to happen to them? Is that possible? I mean, they, uh, may, most of them have already left the country. Mm. Uh, I mean, over a thousand were forcibly removed from the country. Uh, over a thousand were detained. Uh, and many of the students gave up because they couldn't, uh, the evidence against them uh, is not there. They yeah. couldn't go to, yeah. course, uh, to court to protest their innocence. Uh, there was nothing they could do, and they were threatened. Uh, I mean, many of them became destitute. They relied on friends and charities. 
they they were not allowed to work they were not allowed to access health care uh, they're not allowed to drive yeah. i mean yeah. they they were just you know they were put in impossible uh, position situation so many more, many of them actually gave up and returned to their countries but there are still in the uk few thousand of those students. You're still campaigning for, you're still campaigning and Migrant Voice is still campaigning Absolutely. for them. Let me, let me show our audience this, Migrant Voice here, voices of those students whose lives were ruined by the UK Home Office in 2014 finally being heard. These are some of the protesting students and I also want you to listen to them. There has been a documentary that will be coming out a little bit later. Look at migrantvoice.org to hear the impact on the students. Let's end this segment with their voices. Have a listen. I've lost everything actually, those memories, that, that damage cannot be recovered and my, my mental health damage, oh my god, I, I can't sleep, I, I, I can feel that. Even now I can't see the darkness, if I'm in a closed environment, I'm so scared, I get panic attacks, I'm still suffering. <laughs> Thank you, Nizek, for bringing this story to us. Nizek Ramadan, director of Migrant Voice. Okay. Now to South Africa, where millions of people are considering how they will vote in elections in a week's time. The ruling African National Congress is expected to remain in power, but is facing one of its sternest challenges in years from the Democratic Alliance and the economic freedom fighters. President Cyril Ramaphosa says that he wants to reform the ANC, and on Wednesday he addressed the Labour Union rally in Durban. What we do need to do as an alliance is to ensure that we address the challenges that our people are facing now. The challenges of poverty, the challenges of inequality, and the challenges of unemployment. Al Jazeera's Southern Africa correspondent Fermida Miller will be covering the election race. She's in the eastern port city of Durban. And from Johannesburg, we have Nicholas Bauer. He's a reporter for television news channel ENCA and also 702. If you listen in South Africa, you will know that station very well. All right, so Fermida, you are actually literally working on election coverage right now. You dragged yourself away to talk to us about what, what you're doing. What is the biggest story, do you feel, right now? What's, what's the big headline that we should be paying attention to? I think there's so much going on, and perhaps this is what characterizes and what's different about this election in particular compared to the others. But a big issue, really, for many South Africans is corruption. Um, South Africans are dealing with a government and a ruling party that's been embroiled in a number of scandals. And I think the issue for many is, despite... The ANC is saying this is now a time for a re renewal. We're now maybe reinventing ourselves. We're promising you a lot more, especially with the new president, with Sil Ramaphosa, after um, Jacob Zuma resigned. The thing is, though, South Africans aren't seeing what these investigations and these inquiries into corruption what they're actually resulting in and, mm. and whose head, I suppose, is rolling because it really is much of the same um, months on and heading into another election. Yeah. And also major issues around poverty, education, employment. Mm. South Africa has a worrying unemployment rate um, at about 27%. So these issues continue to plague this government and also the opposition parties have to come up with policies that address this. But the ANC has put itself in a tough position considering okay. what's happened in the last few years. Nicholas, I feel that that introduction that we just did about the, the next election, I feel that that's the same introduction that we've been doing for the last few years. Uh, every time we come up to a big election time, uh, Ibrahim puts it really beautifully here. The ANC on Twitter, the ANC is now a shadow of itself. They have lost contact with the electorate, but parties like EFF are identifying with people's problems. That is Ibrahim's take. But do you feel like we're, we're just saying the same thing about the ANC? Well, I can't discount what uh, Ms. Miller said. The ANC is facing a massive challenge heading into this election 25 years after democracy. Mm. Uh, but just touching on the uh, opposition, I mean, in many ways, the opposition has failed as well because 
in the face of all of the ANC's failures and uh, problems that they've brought on this country in their 25 years of governance, it should be fairly easy for the Democratic Alliance or the Economic Freedom Fighters to capitalize on that. But the fact of the matter is, is there's no poll that gives the Democratic Alliance, the largest opposition party, anything above 22 percent. And the Economic Freedom Fighters got a million votes last election, which was about a 6 percent of the electorate, and they're due to about double that. So even in the face of all of these issues, the ANC is still going to, uh, for all intents and purposes, all the polls are showing us, going to win this election. Uh, moreover, when you look at Cyril Ramaphosa's uh, performance in the uh, past year or so since he deposed President Jacob Zuma against uh, many odds, nobody actually predicted he would be able to do so, uh -huh. there's been slow, incremental change. And while Ms. Miller is correct in saying that there hasn't been enough change for uh, yeah, to, to tangibly feel a change in uh, the world's most unequal society, you can't discount the small fundamentals that have been put in place. Right. Uh, and I'm specifically talking about the National Prosecuting Authority. There's a new attorney general in Shamila Batoy, mm. and there's two deputies that were accused of all sorts of malfeasance and corruption, uh, and Nontobo Jiba and Lawrence Mkweli, that have now been fired as a result of one of these commissions of inquiry, uh, which we see about three or four of them going on concurrently at this point in time in South Africa. All right, so let's hear some, some voices of some future, future voters. The election is on May the 8th. These are voters, farmers in Friada in South Africa, talking about hmm, what they want from uh, the election and what they're hoping for, what they're voting for. Have a listen. We see corruption being investigated, but no one is being arrested. If it were me, I would have long been in jail. That's the painful part. Our main problem is that we are starving and we have children. As you see, this farm is working. So why is the government not compensating us with some groceries monthly so we can eat? It would be better if they at least gave us something to live on. I'm just looking here at some of the campaign posters that are on my laptop. So everybody is there hoping to do their rallies, they're getting their message out. For, for me, to, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of what people are expecting, what they're hoping for, what they're voting on. Are we still looking at these basic inequality issues in South Africa? Are they, are they thinking that there's going to party there who might be able to serve them better? Um, Femi, I think that's a very interesting question. I think it also goes back to what Nicholas spoke about a few moments ago, in that these opposition parties haven't perhaps capitalized on the uh, drop in support for the ANC. And I think that raises a number of issues. One, are people staying away from the polls, people who would normally vote for the ANC. They're not happy with the party, but they can't bring themselves to vote for anybody else. And did these opposition parties also rely heavily on Jacob Zuma's presidency? And once he was out of office, what do they go on now? Yeah. Have they managed to grab an, an, the interest of South Africans and offer something solid? Because if that were the case, we would, I think, see these oppositions, perhaps, opposition parties perhaps grow at a faster or more significant sure. rate. Uh, or are they sort of falling apart uh, in terms of their own fi infighting, allegations against other parties, yep. and not actually winning lost ANC voters? Because those people say, well, I'm still loyal to the ANC. I can't bring myself to vote for anybody else. I'm unhappy, so I'll just stay at home. Okay, let me just bring in this. Uh, Nicholas, I found this on your Twitter feed here. Cyril Ramaphosa uh, doing a, a, a panel, a conversation with young people. Hashtag yes for youth, a future that works. He, he was very comfortable with the young people there. Young people's vote is interesting. In the last 45 seconds of our show, tell us about young people and will they go to the polls even? Do they care? Well, let me encapsulate you, uh, encapsulate that, that idea for you in this. Mm. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that there's a sleeping majority in the youth. And you started this conversation by saying, when we talk about South Africa, we seem to be saying the exact same thing. And yeah. that's perhaps why I, for one, am absolutely bored by this election, because there doesn't seem to be anything new coming out of it. And the reason <laughs> there's nothing new coming out of it is because they're not speaking to the youth. Yeah. There's six million young South Africans that have decided not even to register, never mind right. actually go out and vote. Nicholas, and that's out of 12 thank you. million young South Africans. Thank, thank you for not telling us that you were bored until the very end of our segment. Nicholas Barron, Famida Miller, good luck with covering the South African elections. We really appreciate it. I will see you next time. Take care.